<laughs> thank you. Um, and thanks to the Scientific and Steering Committee for inviting me. Um, it's really quite an honor. When you all had your first meeting in Lisbon, Portugal, I was dying to go to that. And uh, for professional and personal reasons, I, there was no way that was going to work. So um, it's really just such a pleasure for me to be here and to learn so much from such a group of reproductive experts. Um, but because my talk is probably bordering on red card length, I'm going to just jump right in. Um, I'm going to present this talk within the context of the idea of productivity. Um, I think that this is a key knowledge gap in fishery science that is being increasingly highlighted in high impact articles. Um, Worm et al. In, in Science in 2009, this paper by Shelton and Mangel that just came out saying that we really need to understand some of the natural drivers of fluctuations in, in abundance and productivity. Um, so I was so excited when uh, Jonah asked me to speak to this topic. Um, and then, of course, one of the things that has been evolving uh, in large part to the people in this room and this wonderful network has been an increased recognition that we need to better understand the role of reproductive biology in this population productivity. Uh, in addition, over the past 20 years or so, there has been a paradigm shift from a focus on life tables with uh, equilibrium assumptions, a single species perspective, and this idea of optimizing yield, with yield being strongly correlated with year class strength, to more of a focus on the underlying processes, an ecosystem perspective, and a focus on conservation and recovery uh, because we have so many overfished stocks. So um, anyone who's worked with me over the past couple of years knows that I uh, have become very interested in temporal scale. So I wanted to start out by putting in context this idea of population productivity um, in temporal and demographic scales. So uh, reproductive variability is going to impact productivity both through egg production, so total egg production, as well as reproductive success. And I'll be coming back to this uh, idea of reproductive success throughout my talk. So what is this? This is really just what are the traits that drive an increased number of surviving offspring to reproductive age? And it is this uh, reproductive success which links current production to future production. So if you look at um, uh, here, population productivity, we typically want to assess this at the stock or population level for management. Um, and what we tend to measure that goes into our models are uh, measures of productivity at the lifetime scale, growth and reproductive output. Uh, but of course, it is at this intergenerational scale that current productivity will be linked to future productivity. And uh, as I mentioned, that's going to be driven by traits that drive reproductive success. It's something that's difficult to study, but I think that we're beginning to have the technological advances which will allow us to do this. And I think that this is a huge area where we need to go. And then, of course, tying it all the way down to the smallest temporal scale and demographic scale, um, reproductive success is going to be driven at the individual level. And physiological processes, uh, shifts, decisions, if you will, of course, happen at relatively uh, short temporal scales. Currently, future productivity is typically predicted based on the slope of the spawner recruit curve near the origin. So over here, where we usually never have data, and if we do, as uh, John Pope uh, showed, we're probably in trouble. Um, and this is considered the steepness or compensatory reserve. And uh, along with this traditional method of predicting future productivity is the assumption that if overfishing is ceased, an overfished stock will recover. But in fact, a number of stocks have shown that this has not happened. And I think that's the million dollar question, why? or maybe the million euro question, why, why is that? Well, I hope that I will convince you by the end of my talk that that's because of factors in addition to spawning stock biomass, um, including egg production, but other factors as well that affect reproductive success and resilience and thus need to be protected. I am uh, talking quite a bit about resilience, so I thought it might be a good idea to actually define this term. It is simply the potential for a system to recover after disturbance and it's been shown, resilience has been shown to increase with diversity or heterogeneity. It's a concept borrowed from ecology um, and is really considered an important ecological service when we're trying to understand the natural buffers that a population might have to withstand stressors. Um, this includes uh, climate change 
and uh, of course fishing, which is a big stressor, and to keep these fish from, uh, these populations from having uh, been fished down to the point that they may actually uh, go through a regime shift and not be able to recover. But in fact, we often don't know what factors affect resilience, nor how fishing may impact or erode them. So the way I've organized this talk is in two main topics. I'm going to start out by talking about reproductive strategies and how they vary over space, time, and parental investment. Then I'm going to focus on reproductive timing. This is a topic that I've been working on and writing about for a while now, um, and discuss some constraints and drivers, since part of the theme is causes of variability. I'm going to work hard to integrate uh, some physiological processes, energetics and oogenesis, and then correlate uh, these processes within a habitat. But really what I mean by that is cold water versus warm water habitats, so really uh, with temperature. And then shift to some of the ways that we're trying to incorporate these types of ideas in our ongoing research, as well as some ways that we might incorporate uh, these ideas in management. So to reproductive strategies, I would like to start off by uh, discussing the life history physiology nexus paradigm, which really boils down to uh, reproductive strategies are complex adaptable systems. And certainly listening to all the talks yesterday, that was very well highlighted. Um, this is really the overarching theme of the special collection of papers that we just published in uh, Marine and Coastal Fisheries, really what I think pulls them all together in addition to having used uh, histology. And uh, when I came across this, uh, the figure that I, that I based this one on in um, Rick Lips and Wilkleski and uh, Young et al, who actually applied it to fish, you know, I thought, wow, that's the figure I've wanted to make for the past 10 years. Um, and I think it has really important implications because uh, obviously survivorship, and this came up a lot yesterday, so mortality rates or survivorship, depending on whether you're a half empty or half full <laughs> type uh, stock assessor, I guess, um, will have impacts and feedback loops, both at the density dependent, in, both in terms of density dependence and, uh, and then a number of things affected by ecological determinants and over ecological timescales. But there are also fitness feedback loops. And for the most part in fishery science, we seem to have just um, uh, ignored is probably the wrong word, but we haven't really incorporated this uh, very much, I think, in our concepts of how fishing impacts populations. Certainly, there's more and more going on with that right now, looking at fisheries-induced evolution. Um, but there may be other factors as well. Um, age truncation, one of the ones that keeps coming up now that we need to look at. So of course, it's the genotype which will be the foundation of uh, uh, reproductive performance being the end result um, of what your original genotype is. And that's going to affect your phenotype, but phenotype will also be affected by these ecological determin determinants, a number of which people are going to be speaking about today. Of course, both these determinants and the phenotype will affect growth. And all of these will affect reproductive performance, which in itself then uh, affects offspring survivorship, and to a lesser extent, perhaps, adult survivorship. So how is reproductive success accomplished? For all species, it's accomplished through either increased reproductive output or adaptations to improve survivorship of that output. Um, clearly, most marine exploited species uh, chose door number one in that they have very high fecundity and consequently very high offspring mortality. And uh, this is really nicely highlighted in that uh, paper which I just love by Hilario and Fran about reproductive strategies and looking at the exploited species, what are the common patterns we see. But their strategies differ in other traits along three main axes, uh, time, space, and parental investment. Of course, I don't have um, all these reproductive traits and reproductive strategies categorized or quantified in a way that I would actually be able to make a graph like this, but maybe someday we will be able to. What I wanted to use this graph for, and of course this came straight from the internet, um, is to show that you do have these three axes with variability and a lot of complex interaction amongst these three axes. So parental investment, that speaks to reproductive effort and energetic trade-offs. Space, um, spatial distribution of spawning, of course, but also the geographic scale of the whole life cycle and distances between adult spawning and nursery habitat. Um, and then time, this is going to affect uh, a lot of things, obviously, but the temporal pattern of food availability, uh, growth, reproduction, and mortality. 
And then a key point just to come back to the reproductive success theme that I, I'm going to really pound, uh, reproductive strategies evolved because of reproductive success at the individual level. So for these species to actually have variable reproductive strategies, there has to have been fitness advantages with particular reproductive traits. I think this is very important, and I think that in general we've just looked at these huge larval mortality rates and assumed that that was not the case. So um, I'm not going to go into all the uh, things that are on this slide, but certainly it, I think this slide speaks to uh, what a huge topic reproductive variability is. There are a range of reproductive parameters, some that we commonly study, some much less commonly studied. And uh, we tend to assess them at the population level, but I think there's beginning to be a lot more work done looking at individual variability. That would be the far right column over here. And I think these are some really key and emerging topics that you can see coming out in the literature. And what I really uh, hope that this slide shows is that we've really only begun to um, study the tip of the iceberg here. So this area that's highlighted is typically what's incorporated into stock assessments. They're beginning to also uh, do fecundity, mainly because of the wonderful efforts of this group. But obviously there's a lot out there that we still do not understand that affects reproductive success and resilience. So shifting to reproductive timing and looking at lifetime reproductive opportunities, um, <clears throat> even with all the variability we see, there are some universal traits. All fish mature uh, only once in a lifetime. They participate in one or more reproductive cycles, uh, age and die. There are some spawning patterns, which uh, were spoken about yesterday. Semilpiris, so those fish uh, participate in only one reproductive cycle. And then most fish, which are iteroparous, can demonstrate either a total spawning pattern or a batch spawning pattern and they can have either determinate or indeterminate fecundity. All of these patterns play a huge role in terms of lifetime reproductive opportunities, and you can see this range of variability from one to over a thousand. This is obviously huge variability, and it, the more reproductive opportunities you have, the more chances you have uh, to get it right, uh, uh, bet hedging strategy. So, Trying to put this in the context of drivers and constraints and the larger life history strategy, this is a quote almost directly from Stearns, 1992. But of course, all life history strategies are trade-offs between how behavior increases the probability of reproductive success versus adult survivorship within the energy limitations imposed by physiology and habitat. So three biggies, food availability, temperature, and mortality. These can act as both drivers and constraints, and in fact do. So starting on the left, food availability obviously uh, plays a major role in available energy, and it uh, looks like there's going to be some nice talks on that later today. Um, energy first has to go to those uh, processes involved with survivorship, metabolism, respiration. Only surplus energy goes into production. Production is obviously a combination of reproduction and growth. And the trade-offs between reproduction and growth are going to be driven by uh, both the temporal patterns of mortality and in terms of uh, at the lifetime, when within the lifetime do you mature and how much growth occurs after maturity. This is going to be driven by size-specific mortality. And these trade-offs are um, something that Fran is working on, a, a review paper, a really nice review paper, trying to bring in some of these uh, from the oocyte developmental stages to some of these trade-offs. So this slide um, is, a, is a little difficult. I, I probably could have spoken just 30 minutes on this slide, but I'm going to try and just whiz through it. Um, but I really wanted to put it up here because I would love to get your uh, feedback as experts, whether you think this makes sense or not. Um, I want to focus on this one, what I consider key physiological process that plays a role in life history traits such as timing of maturity, spawning seasonality, and somatic growth. Um, and it has to do with the oogenesis process. Oogenesis for uh, almost all teleos is very similar, and it, uh, we see these very typical oocyte growth developmental stages, and we heard a lot about them yesterday. So there's primary growth, then there's secondary growth, um, which we typically consider the cortical alveolar stage, the first stage of secondary growth. Uh, vitellogenesis, 
Um, then there's oocyte maturation. Uh, for many species, they need to complete vitellogenesis and receive an external cue from the environment to actually uh, commit oocytes to a spawning event, meaning once you've started oocyte maturation, unless something goes terribly wrong, you continue, and then of course you have a spawning event, and we can't have these without eggs or, or for live berries um, offspring. But I really want to focus on this junction here, which is also a key junction in the oogenesis process, linked with the environment. You have to have an individual fish has to have the correct internal and external factors for oogenesis to cross this threshold from primary growth to secondary growth. So what goes into this? As I mentioned, uh, you have to have uh, an individual has to have surplus energy to uh, begin to shift some energy to reproduction. So sufficient growth and energy accumulation. In addition, they have to develop the brain pituitary gonad axes. Um, and a lot of these ideas, actually, I got from the wonderful special section on uh, maturation that Tara led. I, I love that collection of papers. Um, and then they, uh, if all these things are met and they cross this energetic threshold, which we do not yet have uh, exactly figured out how best to measure this. It is species specific. But if they cross this energetic threshold, under the correct environmental conditions, then they will recruit oocytes from primary growth to secondary growth. Um, and recent physiological uh, research has shown that this process uh, appears to be mediated by insulin-like growth factors. So I think this is a very important linkage between uh, the oogenesis process, energetics, and the environment. So what can this potentially explain? At the lifetime scale, uh, maturity, we certainly see phenotypic plasticity and size at maturity. Um, and through the concept of the energy allocation theory, if you mature earlier and at a smaller size, you will have less energy to put towards growth, so your maximum size will also be smaller. Um, this also is from this review paper that Fran and I are, are working together on, uh, along with Jonah and Hilario. Um, so what does this mean? If you have warmer temperatures, you tend to have faster growth rates, faster energy acquisition, um, presumably reaching this threshold earlier. So you're going to have smaller size at maturity, smaller maximum size. And in fact, Polly, I believe it was in 1984, um, talked about how these must be linked. And now physiological research is showing that, in fact, in terms of the endocrine system, it looks like they are. So I think that that's a very important advancement in terms of linking these uh, key processes. Um, I think this was also brought up somewhat yesterday and will be discussed more. I think this also is playing a very important role in spotting patterns. Um, so if you're thinking about how often does uh, an individual cross that energetic threshold within the correct environmental conditions, that's, that's key, um, will be driving how many times you're recruiting from primary to secondary growth. And that, in relation to the duration of the spawning season and how uh, far in advance of the beginning of the spawning season it occurs, will drive these oocyte uh, developmental stages that are patterns that we see, you know, ranging from synchronous to asynchronous. Um, and Coast has talked a little bit about that. And we've worked together on a paper and are working on a sister review paper to Franz, um, looking into more of those aspects. At the reproductive cycle scale, I think this also has uh, really important implications because we are seeing more and more demographic effects where older and larger fish um, develop earlier and spawn longer. And I believe it was the yellowfin tuna talk uh, yesterday that talked about that. And uh, Olaf has shown this for cod. And I've seen this in a number of species I've studied. And if you think about energetics, that makes sense. Older individuals typically have better reserves. They also, especially if they're piscivorous, have better capability of catching their dinner. And so it makes sense that they would have they would cross that threshold earlier and be able to develop earlier. So putting this in the context of habitat, um, and by this I mean warm water, cold water, basically uh, what I want to show is that uh, if you're in a cold water habitat, typically you have a restricted spawning season and slow oocyte growth, which means you have a very short window to meet your energetic threshold. In comparison, in a warm water, you typically have an extended spawning season, much faster oocyte growth rates, and a longer effective window to, uh, to meet that threshold. And this has important implications in terms of how flexible and resilient the systems will be. In addition, cold water reproduction, uh, meeting the correct environmental conditions, 
uh, it's been shown that the key proximate cue is photo period. So um, that's also going to be obviously less flexible than uh, some warm water, what's more typical in warm water, where temperature plays a bigger role in terms of initiating uh, development and spawning. So to some of the research we've been doing to try and integrate these ideas, um, we, uh, I guess I should explain where I'm from first. So I'm from Florida, that's here. And uh, Research Institute is right here um, and uh, on the border with Tampa Bay. And we've been studying spotted sea trout really as our lab rat because it has a closed uh, population over small spatial scales, complete life cycle within Tampa Bay. Um, one of the things we've been trying to do is integrate reproductive dynamics within the whole life cycle. So some of these trade-offs. Um, we've been lucky enough to uh, have some uh, money to do telemetry studies and to have identified uh, a spawning site where fish move solely to spawn, so they're only there at the spawning time. 97% of the females are hydrated um, in our catch-based samples. So uh, with acoustic tracking, we've been able to look at how frequently do they go to these sites to spawn and found that males, in fact, were going there four times more frequently than females. In addition, males make uh, sounds associated with courtship with their specialized sonic muscles. So they're also expending energy in this fashion. And this seems to explain uh, something that I never understood about this species, and that's that males, here in blue, actually show uh, slower growth rates and smaller size than females, here in pink. Um, females, on average, are um, producing batches of 400,000 eggs. And with the traditional method of estimating spawning frequency, we're supposed to spawn every five days over uh, about a six-month period. But it's looking like they actually spawn less frequently, and in fact, males may be putting more energy into it. This species is uh, managed, as so many are, on a uh, size, but a slot size, which is indicated by these dashed lines. And because of these sex-specific growth rates, you can see that fishing is actually disproportionately impacting females. So we have a higher F on females. But what we saw is that sex ratios at the oldest age were very similar. And with some catch curve analysis, uh, the Zs, so total instantaneous mortality, is quite similar, which suggests that natural mortality is actually higher for males. And this makes sense because there's some literature coming out suggesting that the sounds they make actually uh, sound like, come eat dinner here, to a dolphin, which is their, one of their main predators. We also are very interested in spatial um, dynamics, and uh, Sierra Walters has a nice paper on this. We mapped uh, all the spawning sites in Tampa Bay, that's the blue dots, using passive acoustics, so that was the sound production of males. And we have a juvenile survey, that's the hot colored dots, uh, which uh, goes on to fine tune our stock assessments, but uh, is willing to share their information with me. This is the past spawning site that I suggest that I talked about, and uh, it's the only site we found that is so continuously used and so densely populated. So we are very interested in using the genetics methodology that I think John was uh, talking about yesterday to see if we could begin to assess some of these issues associated with reproductive success. Uh, we're using it uh, as, a, uh, as a tag, really. So they can, on microsatellite uh, genetics, they can actually identify individuals as well as identify the uh, number of parents that would have contributed to the juveniles in any given year class. So that will get to uh, reproductive success. Is there actually a, a spatial component associated with a spawning site? As well as what is the effective spawning size and how does that spawning population and how does that compare to the census population? In addition, we have uh, several initiatives ongoing at our institute uh, looking at ways to uh, integrate productivity with the ecosystem. Um, and uh, the only one that I'm, well, I, I'm involved in these working groups, but the one that I'm actively involved in is this one, uh, agent-based modeling of reproductive traits. And we are working to develop some management strategy evaluation simulations to look at the um, importance of these traits. Um, what we have done so far um, is to look at demographic effects uh, from some detailed information we had um, this is a little bit of a complicated slide, but the take-home message is that we had two different age distributions with different times in the fishery. Um, the blue is the uh, age distribution with larger, older fish incorporated, and you can see that as you increase these demographic effects, uh, TEP increases, and uh, spawning stock bio is not proportional to spawning stock biomass. So back to where I started, um, I think one of the things we really uh, 
need to recognize is how complex these systems are. We need standardized data so that we can compare them. I think that's one of the wonderful things that's been accomplished by the Fresh Network is uh, working towards that. And of course, we want to understand when fishing impacts adult survivorship, is it impacting fitness or density dependence? And I hope that we'll begin to discuss some of these ways that uh, reproductive resilience may be impacted. This nice paper by Frank and Brickman talks about how resilience is correlated with interspecific diversity. So some things that I talked about in the talk, so I'm not going to talk about them again because I'm running out of time, but uh, would be glad to discuss with anyone later on. And I just would like to leave you with this question, you know, how do we define recruitment over fishing and could we maybe do it better by using our reproductive experience to begin to measure some of these things that impact reproductive resilience? Um, this graph is uh, the historic age distributions for South Atlantic red snapper. They're estimated to be at 5% of their virgin spawning stock biomass. Um, but what are some of the other factors that we may have uh, changed, uh, resilience that we may have eroded with this level of fishing? And how can we measure what we're at before we have a collapse? These are so overfished, um, even though they can still produce strong year classes, potentially just one or two more stressors, climate change, maybe an oil spill, uh, could put them over the edge. So I would like to stop there. Some quick acknowledgments. Sarah and Joel, who uh, have worked with me for 10 years, make everything happen. David, who came to visit and has been so gracious showing me around. My co-editors, Fran, of course. And Fran, of course, is not happy unless he's organizing five meetings, I'm sure everybody knows. So I just wanted to mention that we're working on a meeting in 2013 on reproductive resilience. Thank you so much.